All right, so we're recording. Um, one second, so should gallery view. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm here uh, with David Murphy um, and uh, to discuss The Road to Serfdom by Frederick Hayek. Uh, this is a book that David has discussed extensively on his channel uh, and he sort of turned me on to this book and to these ideas. Uh, it's obviously a topic that I'm very interested in, um, sort of liberalism and, and the political you know, divides and ideologies in the animate American politics. So yeah, I have some questions and I'm just happy uh, to have this opportunity to discuss it with you, David. Yeah, no, thanks for asking me because normally <laughs> this doesn't happen. Typically once I start talking about Hayek's critique of socialism, people change seats on the bus. So it was nice to have someone <laughs> reach out to me. Um, and actually before we get to your questions, uh, a couple just occurred to me. And I'm curious to know how you uh, enjoyed reading the book because Hayek isn't what I would call the greatest prose stylist in the world. And typically when people read this for the first time, they find it a lot more abstract than they thought it would be. Oh yeah. I did not enjoy reading the book, to be honest. <laughs> it was, it was, for me, it was a slog. Um, to be totally honest, that's, that's the honest truth. I didn't enjoy his prose style. And like you said, I mean, just to echo exactly what you said, also it felt very abstract and I, I like, I wish it was more concrete. And so that's sort of why I wanted to have this dialogue to like make it more concrete. Yeah, and it's worth noting that Hayek's uh, first language was, of course, German, and then he, he learned English, and so that's part of it, too, but he tended to write how he talked, and he talked with lots of subclasses, mm -hmm. and so it can be difficult for, for a new reader, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, cool. So I just, um, I sent you, like, some, some questions that I just sort of thought as, like, bullet points that we can, like, go through, and, and maybe I'll, like, I'll just you know, state the question, take a stab at it, and then we can talk about it. And, you know, the goal will be, you know, not to get like caught up on anything and, you know, just uh, keep this like relatively brief, you know, you don't need to. Yeah. Yeah. And I just stress also, I haven't read this for over a year, but I am very familiar with the book. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No worries. Um, okay. So my first one was briefly summarize the thesis of like the road to serfdom. So um, this is, this is what I understand as, as the thesis. Uh, it starts with an observation. First of all, he's writing in like the, the 1940s, I believe. And, and so the published world, in 45. Yeah. So, so he's writing like when the world is in turmoil. And on the one hand, you have Nazism. On the other hand, you have Stalinism. And these are both like disastrous regime, regimes. And it seems to me like the book is coming from this like observation, like the starting point, which, which I think is very compelling, that there's a, there's a link. There's a correspondence between what happened in Nazi Germany and what happened in Russia, where you have two like they're considered often on opposite ends of the ends of the political spectrum, like the right and left, but they're like both failed totalitarian states. And so he says, he's asking this question of like, what is this common cause? Like what is the root uh, most common um, denominator you might say or whatever that underlies both these disasters? Um, so far, do you agree with what I said? Yeah, I know that's a good contextualization. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a reaction to that, definitely. It, it, specifically, it's a reaction to the idea that fascism is, well, the language we would use today is a kind of late stage capitalism. It's the last gasp of the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. right. And he's saying that socialism and fascism are just two different types of central planning. And I know people object to that, and usually the response is that, well, obviously, fascism isn't Bolshevikism, you know, it doesn't have a dialectical materialism or anything like that. But he's saying in terms of the economics, they're both systems that rely on central planning and they have more in common with each other than they do liberalism. And so that's what he's definitely reacting to. Right. Yeah. So, so that makes sense. And I agree with that. But um, it seems to me like when I when I read it, that he's he's answering a question of like, how do societies become this, you know? Um, so I, in my mind, I was like sort of, uh, thinking like an alternative title would be like the origins of totalitarianism, which of course is a Hannah Arendt book, but the point, Arendt, yeah. yeah, but of course, like the point he's grappling with that same question, it seems to me like he's grappling with how do these, uh, societies sort of come about. And as you, I think already mentioned, like the, what he identifies as the root issue is central planning. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, uh, First of all, when Hannah Arendt died, they found a, a copy of Hayek's book in her library, so that's an interesting note. But that, that really isn't the thesis of the book. He was definitely concerned with central planning and how that takes you down the road to serfdom, right, to a totalitarian state. But 
really the thesis of the book is that central planning, comprehensive, that's the key word, comprehensive central planning can only be carried out by a state that has totalitarian powers and it's incompatible with a democratic system. That, that really is what the central thesis of the book right. is. Right. Great. And yeah, so that's well said. Yeah. yeah. That's well said. So yeah, my next- Kind of uh, incoherence, right? And so I think it's chapter three that's on democratic socialism. And what he says basically is that it's incoherent and you're going to have to achieve system, uh, uh, socialism through means that the socialists themselves would even disapprove of. Right. Okay. So my next question, if we can switch to it, is what exactly is central planning? Can we just like, like identify some examples just to sort of like ground us a little bit? Because as we mentioned earlier, I felt like this was one of the parts that felt very abstract to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. And he does define it in chapter three, although it's in a very long paragraph that's only like one or two sentences long, so it can be tough to catch. And the key is that, again, central planning is comprehensive. And so it's, so in other words, the welfare state isn't socialism, which is why I often get frustrated why conservatives tend to hijack this book and point toward, for example, uh, socialized healthcare as being socialism. That's really not what Hayek means. He means that it is a comprehensive central plan according to a blueprint. And that is very much what the socialists of his time were talking about. And although we gave the example of Russia and Germany, this was starting to crop up in the United Kingdom and in, in the West more generally, because of course you had wartime planning. So they're saying, hey, look, we can do it for the war effort. We should carry this over after the war. And then of course you had the beverage report as well. And so I can't stress that enough. It is economic planning according to a central blueprint. Typically, you'll hear it referred to in the shorthand as the uh, control of the means of the product, control of the means of production by the state. So that's really interesting because I, I sort of read the book through a contemporary political lens and sort of through like uh, you know like like if you read the Wikipedia page for example like like National Review like is like considers this like the most important nonfiction book of all time and a lot of like Republican politicians like you were saying like they they rely heavily on this book. So is there any analogy to that in modern, in our modern political discourse? Analogy to what? Central planning, like a totally centralized economy like that. Like we're not in wartime, like we're not in a, a co economy of war. So like, okay, so <clears throat> like Medicare, <laughs> Medicare for all, Medicaid for all. Like, is, are yeah, these, that, would, that wouldn't be an example of it. One thing that you read, and I think this is right, is that there's actually no empirical evidence to refute Hayek's claim. And Hayek's claim is extremely unoriginal and in a way very ordinary in the way that I just described it. If you tally up the countries who have uh, uh, centralized the means of production in the hands of the state and planned their economy according to a central blueprint, count how many of those were able to maintain efficiency and individual liberty. There isn't any. Right. And so actually pointing to examples where you have a heavy welfare state doesn't refute the central claim of the book. Now, Hayek would have some problems with those systems, but also if you read the road to serfdom carefully, he actually notes that he doesn't have a problem with the social safety net. And if you go on to read the Constitution of Liberty, which is a book he published after this, he details the constitutional order that he uh, that might work. And in there, he's more specific about interventions that he's actually okay with. So he didn't believe, and in this book, he criticizes a laissez-faire position. But having a social safe, safety net is very, very different from having a state that controls the means of production. Okay. So this, that was very helpful. I think if I, if I read the book with that mind frame, mindset, like, I think two things would happen. I think the book would become less interesting <laughs> and it also become like maybe somewhat more intelligible. But I, I, I sort of was reading it through the mind frame of like our contemporary political discourse. And I feel like that made it uh, a much more difficult read. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think there still are ways to do that though, because you're talking about, and I think you have a question here about the mechanism of moving towards central planning and the way he saw it happening in Germany was through I guess it would be martial evocations. I think that's the term Bruce Caldwell 
uses, right? And then also through a accretion of anti-liberal sentiments over a series of years. And actually, I recently read uh, uh, Richard Evans' book on the coming of the Third Reich, and I definitely read that. I, I read that. I read that too. I read that with the read along. Yeah, so you know exactly what I mean. We had this growth of anti-liberal sentiments, and that became institutionalized. And then you have a series of, like I said, uh, martial adjurations, basically, and that set a precedent. So that's what he saw happening. That's the process that he saw. But again, it wasn't inevitable. But there is an incoherence between a democratic system, like the idea of Weimar, and the central planning that they were going down. And the thing is that they kept pushing that incoherent system and uh, the consequences were totalitarian. Now, I, I was answering your question about how you could read it today. I think you can read it in terms of like emergency powers, which is obvious after 9-11 and has continued since then, right? So that would be one example of it. But then also obviously today with people who are bringing back the term democratic socialism and that's what I, th I think it was chapter three is about. <clears throat> Okay. So they say that they want businesses to be run democratically, but then they still are supporting uh, politicians who have centralized policy proposals, right? So the rhetoric and I think the policy are incoherent. So, okay. So just, can you spell that out like a little more? So what, what's the, what's an example of like, of like, of the policy proposal, which uh, would sort of fall into the centralized planning bucket? Among Democratic Socialists of America, let's say they're an organization that's considered very far to the left, relatively speaking. Well, does my question make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it does. But again, I think most of it is that if you look at their platform, many of the policies are state directed. I think that's basically the point that I'm making. And like what, like healthcare, like like free college? Healthcare understand. would be an example. Yeah. So healthcare would be state directed. But but again, healthcare itself isn't necessarily. Socialist, just because you have socialized healthcare, it's it's state ownership and direction of the means of production. And what I was saying is that the rhetoric is that this should be done. Basically, corporations should be run democratically. But the thing is, there's nothing preventing anybody from running de uh, corporations democratically in the system that we have right now. And they aren't pursuing it, and they aren't pursuing it because it doesn't work, right? And they're also not pursuing it because they would prefer to do it through uh, state means. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I think. Yeah, that, I think. That, that's, that's separate. I mean, that's a, my opinion. Right. It doesn't reflect on the book, but. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah, and I want to stick with the book. Yeah, we should definitely stick with the book. Um, okay, I guess, I guess maybe a common theme you'll hear in my questioning uh, just like emanates from the fact that like, again, we've, we've touched on this already, but it, it didn't feel so like grounded in practicality, you know? And I just wanted to like help bridge the gap between like theory and like practical sort of political discussion. Um, but let's let's move on to this question of um, the mechanism, right? Which you touched on already. Um, the mechanism by which central planning leads to totalitarianism. So, like, so for example, Richard Evans, right? Basically, any book that's going to discuss uh, the story of of Nazism in Germany, Germany is going to like deal with a mechanism with which liberalism was rejected by a large amount of people. I mean, I don't think I think Richard Evans says that the Nazis never won a majority. Um, but they obviously were, you know, elected, uh, excuse me. But he also said a vote for the socialist parties was also a vote against democracy, too. Because mm. you have okay. to understand, the, the parties that believed in democracy were, when you include the fascist parties as well as the socialist parties, were a smaller proportion than you might think. Interesting. Okay. So, so when I read Richard Evans, my my takeaway wasn't that central planning was what led to the lack of uh, faith in democracy. I mean, my takeaway was that it was like the uh, Treaty of Versailles and like the hyperinflation in the wake of, you know, total economic collapse and just like total disillusionment, uh, mostly emanating from like economic uh, disillusionment that led to disillusionment in the, you know, liberal uh, form of government. Is that, is that, do you think? Well, Hayek mean? doesn't say that it's just central planning that leads to... Mm -hmm. So, so what's so right? So well, what's well? Okay, my, all I'm saying was that's true. What no. what he's saying though is that once you have a comprehensive central plan, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between uh, political control and economic control. 
Let me think about that. So economic centralization becomes political control as well, because once you have a comprehensive plan for the economy, you're directing resources, and that gives you control over individuals' decisions. Whereas individuals would previously, in a sense, plan for themselves, you're now planning for people themselves. Okay. So this was, this was something I really struggled with throughout the book. And, and I found very hard to wrap my head around. Maybe, maybe you can help me. And if not, maybe it's just, you know, my uh, being too, um, I don't know, unreasonable. But, like, if, it reminds me of, like, the book The Power Broker, um, which is about uh, Robert Moses in uh, New York. So he, yeah. he, he did a lot of central funding. He was unelected, government official, very illiberal. Um, but, he, you know, he, he was responsible for, like, placing highways, and, and, and managing, you know, uh, all sorts of questions of eminent domain and like where transportation is going to go. And, and there were winners and losers um, in all these decisions. Um, and he, he like wrecked havoc in, uh, in New York and he like destroyed poor communities and things like that. But like the solution to that, you know, I think the problem there was the fact that he wasn't a democratically elected official. But you imagine if there, when there is democratic oversight, like if you elect someone, and that person has the job to make these decisions. How does that lead to anti-liberal sentiment? Like I, I'm, I'm missing a step here, and maybe I, I don't know if my question makes sense. Well, once the state takes on so many tasks, it's no longer practical or possible for the democratically elected officials to carry them out. So they end up delegating, and of course, right. we see that here in the United States now more and more as well. So what happens? And this is what he means by saying that. Uh, democratic socialists will find their plans carried out through means that they don't approve. He's saying that eventually this is just going to have to be done bureaucratically. It's not practical to do it democratically. But, but to me, that's democracy, though. I, I don't see that as, as not being democracy. Dele yeah, that's, I guess, maybe the disconnect. I don't see delegation as being undemocratic. Like, like when I elect, when I elect, when I vote for, for a government official, I'm not voting for that government official because they're going to write tax policy. I'm voting for them because they're going to like find experts. Who not are going anymore. To delegate. They're not going to delegate. No, they're not going to write tax policy. Not anymore. No. <laughs> right. Or, or any policy. I don't care. Like, 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 like regulate. But it wasn't always that way. Well, there's an infinite number of policies. So like, even if they were writing tax policy, I mean, were they going to be writing like, like regulations on, on, you know, import, you know, business of a certain good? Like, no, there's always delegation that goes on in that process. You're hiring someone who's going to delegate. Like that's just to me, the definition of democracy. Well, that's a strange definition of democracy, but Hayek, I should say, differentiates between good planning and bad planning. And so he views uh, democratic systems as allowing uh, for a framework of rules that people can operate in. What happens is you go beyond having that and believe that you should give people the means to achieve the good life, for example, right? But the thing is, there is never going to be much agreement, right, about these policy ends. So in the end, they do have to be delegated, and there's nothing democratic about that. Again, again this was another, we're hitting on another point that I really struggle with in the book. And again, it could be me. It could totally be me. And it could be that anyone watching this will not have the same issue. But when you talk about they, there's not going to be agreement on the ends, like that's like the fundamental problem of civilization. And the answer to that problem, the fact that different people have different agendas, which Hayek talks about, obviously, and different uh, interest groups have different ends in mind, is that is you vote, right? There's a democratic process to pick uh, someone who's responsible then for like picking winners and losers, ultimately. And so it seemed to me like, again, maybe I'm misunderstanding something. It seemed to me like he saw that this idea of government picking winners and losers undermines democracy, when to me, that literally is democracy. We pick winners and losers by voting, and then picking someone who's responsible for, for making these decisions. Okay, but that's very uncontrolled. There are two different, because because you can reach social ends through the market and not through the state, right? The problem with state uh, direction is that it can only be done categorically. And the problem with categorical decision-making is that opens you up to generalized error, to use statistical reasoning, we might say type one or type two errors. To give a specific example, let's take the FDA. If the FDA rejects a safe and effective drug, right, that would be a type one error. And that would be generalized throughout the society and they would be deprived of that. But if they approve an unsafe drug, 
It's a type two error, and then that problem is also gonna be generalized over society. And that's the problem with state decided categorical decision making. And that's true whether it's done democratically or through some other type of system. Decisions when done on the market are more incremental or transactional, right? So when you're saying that reaching social ends through democracy is, the way you're talking makes it sound like that's the only way to uh, solve problems. And Hayek and I would reject that, right? The point of a democratic system is to have those framework of rules, but also be flexible enough to make changes as need be, right? And I think Hayek's view of democracy, which is admittedly, I think, naive, was that it, it's the most preferable system, although I, I don't think he's exactly keen on it, but it's the best way to make collective decisions in a way that won't be totalitarian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. But there's an incoherence, again, between trying to central plan and delegate and maintain democracy. You can do that to an extent, but there is a point at which if you push it too far, right, that, that's basically Hayek's argument. Okay. Well, I th I, an example I think of is like the Federal Reserve, that we have the chairman or chairwoman of the Federal Reserve who's responsible for setting interest rates. And there's like, oh, he, he explicitly does not mean central banking in here. Okay. Well, I, what, what's, why is that different? Like that's, a, it's well, it's, he's very losers. careful to use that language, particularly, I don't have the quote in front of anybody, but it, it's again, central direction by ownership of the means of production. He's putting central banking to the mm -hmm. side here. Okay. And, and Hayek's views on central banking change a lot over his life, but he, he very explicitly does not mean that. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, that's fair, but again, it seems like his argument would apply it's insofar as his argument is like that you you, you give up uh, democratic control, which is sort of true because like as a oh, yeah, voter, I'm I mean, not I voting on the you, chair yeah. of the Fed, you know, and but but we assume that like that the people that we elect hopefully are appointing qualified people who have our best interests in mind because of a like a stacked process of democratic accountability. I, I agree that the argument should apply, right? So if you take it in the goods market, right? The, the price of a good is determined by supply and demand, the arbitrage of the market, the state doesn't know uh, what the price should be, and they don't have the information to replicate that. Well, likewise, in money, you have the money market, the price of which is the interest rate. So why does the central bank know what that should be too? Yeah, I, I to totally agree that the argument should apply. But I'm just saying in terms of the book, we should be careful because Hayek is very careful about saying well, he, I don't, he doesn't literally say this, but he, he does not mean the central bank. And he wrote about this elsewhere. Okay, that's fair. So that's good to know. I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize that. But um, no, that's all right. Yeah, no, I, I, but okay. So that, that was like an example of like one of the concrete instances I was trying to apply it to and I sort of struggled with. Um, okay. But I, I think we can move on uh, to the next question. We're, we're making good, good time here, which I think is good. We're, we're like uh, halfway through. Um, so, so the next question, does, does the central planning always lead to totalitarianism according to Hayek? Um, why are we not? So we may, we may have touched on this a little bit, um, towards the beginning. So, so I, I think explicitly, I think the answer is clearly no, it doesn't. No, but he's been accused of it and he was accused of it by his contemporaries. Right. Paul Samuelson accused him of, of it. Robert Solo accused him of it. And he was very, very aggravated about this. In fact, he wrote a personal letter to Samuelson he was extremely ag aggravated and Samuelson even apologized for it. But it's something that hung over he his head a lot. I, I think, I think uh, Bob Solo used the term snowballing to serfdom or something like that. But in the early pages of the book, he's very straightforward about saying this does not necessarily have to happen. You can change your course. And also, if you understand Hayek's other work, he criticizes historians for using this sort of reasoning. So not only has, had he criticized people for using this type of reasoning, he explicitly says earlier in the book that this isn't an inevitable thing that's going to happen and that he's been criticized for it quite a lot, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, and I actually uh, picked up on that from the introduction of the book uh, of whatever, my version. Uh, they talked about that too. Yeah, so that's I think, got Bruce Caldwell's introduction. It's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's writing a big biography of Hayek, actually. And I was in a Zoom conversation the other day with Pete Becky. He's a professor over at George Mason University. I'm in a reading group. Mm -hmm. And he's proofreading the book. And he said in the, uh, I, I guess I don't know what it'd be called, but the TypeScript pages, it's like 1,200 pages. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. 
Okay, nice. Um, so I guess I guess then the follow-up question is like, okay, so granted, it doesn't always, and Hayek was aware of that, and and that's fair. That's totally fair. But like, I, to me, from my perspective, I'm I'm reading this as like one possibility among many of different positions people have put forward to explain uh, the reason some countries remain democratically successful and some don't. And obviously America, I think, is going through something similar right now. Like we're, we might not be democratic in, in 50 to 100 years, you know, or even less. I, so the point is, like, these are very pressing questions. I just wonder if- Or now. What would you say? For now. Or yeah. now. Or now what? We're not now, hardly. Right. No, okay. Well, well, it's all relative, so it's, it's on a spectrum. But, but you're right. I, I, I think I was hedging way too much. And I agree. I think, I think there's a crisis of democracy in America now. I think that's a real thing. Um, and so my point is, is there, does history, if not disprove any of Hayek's theses, like at least give, like, like weaken them? Because, because there doesn't seem to have been, like his alarm isn't, didn't seem to have come to fruition. Okay, but again, he never said that socialized health care leads to the jackboot. That wasn't his argument. His argument was that comprehensive central planning can only be done by a state that has complete control, and that's incompatible with individual liberty, and there is no empirical evidence to refute that claim. Well, but no, he, he was responding... that ...and maintained individual liberty and economic efficiency. Okay, that's fair, but he was, I think, resp to be fair, like he was responding to... Uh, like a political movement in like Britain at the time, and you talked well, about already the time economy to socialist economists. So, I, I, we should have talked about this earlier. But in 1920, there was a paper written by Ludwig von Mises, another Austrian economist, who Hayek knew, called "Economic Calculation of the Socialist Commonwealth." It was published in 1920, and in that paper, he proved the impossibility of socialist planning when you eliminate private property and the means of production because resources are coordinated in time and space by prices. Prices are determined through arbitrage on the market by people who own private property. When you eliminate private property, you eliminate that system and central governments cannot rationally allocate resources. And the socialists of the time recognize that. In fact, Oscar Lange, a famous market socialist, uh, worth your time reading if, if you're interested in this kind of thing, he said there would be a place in the Great Hall for Ludwig von Mises of socialists because he identified this problem and they went to try and solve it. And then Oscar Lange and, and some others then sparred with Hayek over this debate and Hayek extended it into something called the knowledge problem, right? Mm -hmm. And then in 1935, he published a collection called Collectivist Economic Planning, which in terms of the theoretical debate, it was basically the nail in the coffin of, of central planning. And so he was responding to that on the theoretical level, and then in the political dimension, it was responding to what he had seen on the continent, and then also the way things were tending in Britain at that time. Okay, okay. that's fair. And so again, like, one, maybe this is not your intention, but like one of the consequences of having this discourse is clarifying, it's helping me like understand better, but it also seems to minimize like the relevance of the book. Well, again, it's very much a book of its time because if you read his footnotes, he's responding to specific people. He's quoting his contemporaries the whole time. And so you have to remember that Oscar Lange, who I just mentioned, his plan for market socialism allowed for individual choice in the labor market and in consumer markets, but it completely nationalized the uh, markets for production, right, which was the central, which was the problem. And then you had his contemporaries in the UK arguing for centralized planning of that sort after the war. And so, well, you may not feel like that debate's going on right now, and so then it doesn't feel relevant. It was very much the conversation that was going on at that time and for the 20 years before it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, this still holds. The central point still holds. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, so uh, number next question um, is: What are the exceptions to Hayek's rule? Uh, what are the instances that of central planning that he finds acceptable? So this might that not be a good question. Yeah, that's a good question because he does identify plenty of areas of central planning that he finds acceptable. And I don't remember where it is, but even in the road to serfdom, he says that they could ban the use of uh, drugs. He was fine with that sort of thing, which mm -hmm. I don't think too many libertarians would approve of now. 
and he's also fine with the social welfare net. And he specifically, as we mentioned before, spoke out against, I think he, I think he refers to it as the wooden laissez-faire policy of people like Ludwig von Mises. So he was comfortable with some intervention. The key, the key is that it doesn't intervene in the process of production. That's really the main point for him. And that's hard to tease out in this book if you haven't uh, before, you're not familiar with Hayek, but if you want to get him more detailed on those points, you'll want to go to the Constitution of Liberty and then Law, Leg Law Legislation Liberty published after that. Okay. That, that was a huge source of frustration for me in the book, like not understanding that line. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, it's a kind of book. That's like, not your fault. That's Hayek's fault. I should right. say. Yes. Like, I read, yeah. I read like fiction books sometimes that are over my head, and I need like, you know, like Shakespeare or whatever. I need like, I need like the Cliff Notes or something to like help me through. Like, I feel like I needed that for this book because, yeah. because it was such a source of frustration to not know where, where is this line. Like, I have the quote, I printed it out um, on my uh, sheet here. So, okay. there is no reason why in a society which has reached a general level of wealth ours has. The first kind of security should not be guaranteed to all without endangering general freedom. That is, some minimum of food, shelter, and clothing sufficient to preserve health. Nor is there any, yeah, and nor is it, one last sentence, nor is there any reason why the state should not help to organize a comprehensive system of social insurance in providing for those common hazards of life which few can make adequate provision. Again, and the key there is that he doesn't view, I mean, I should say I disagree with that, but, and many libertarians have been frustrated by his comments to that effect, but, but the key here is that it, those don't, according to him, intervene in the process of production, and centralizing the, pro the process of production is the debate politically and economically that had been going on. So that's okay. what he was concerned. That's about. fair, right? So I know I know you disagree with that, and I want to stick with discussing Hayek instead of instead yeah, of yeah, yeah, discussing yeah, no, I do too. I do too. But, yeah. But it, it was just funny from my perspective because I totally agree with it. Like I agree with it strongly. And so I'm reading this like very troubling, like confusing book where I don't really understand where he draws a line. I'm like, like maybe Hayek is just an ally. Like maybe you know so, maybe he's like a modern socialist. You know? Like, okay, don't say that. But uh, let's talk about that idea of drawing the line because there isn't really a principle in the book where he says okay, at this point, we can't have a drop more of central planning, right? There really isn't anything like that in that book. I, I completely agree. The best thing that we get is the distinction between generalized rules and then command rules, right? That, that's really the main difference that we get, and it isn't exactly satisfying. And this was, this is, I think, probably the best criticism of the book, and it was done at the time. Elvin Hansen, uh, another great economist made that criticism. I think it was in the New Republic. I don't, I don't remember, though. And then Keynes made that criticism in a letter to them. They, they were corresponding. And he basically says, you identify good planning versus uh, bad planning, but you don't tell us where to draw the line. And so the project Hayek took on after publishing this book in the books that I mentioned a moment ago is trying to articulate where exactly that line is. And in a way, that's the point of his book, The Constitution of Liberty. So your frustration is, in fact, a very intuitive because that is, I think, the main problem with his argument. It was pointed out at the time, and he tried to articulate it later on. Do you think Hayek would be against the FDA for the reasons we discussed as being central planning? I suspect so, but I, I don't really like trying to do that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I tried to do this whole book. Just to what people would and would not. Uh, Every single work. page in the book, I'm trying to answer the question. Like, like it's very simple. Does Hayek like the FDA or not like the FDA? Like, it's all I wanted, you know, to understand. Which may sound like a silly kind of very surface level way to read the book, but like, I just wanted like something to hold on to, you know, like practically speaking, if that makes sense, you know. Okay, but we don't have to. We don't have to speculate. Okay. Um, so that's it. Last, last question here. I think this is, uh, I think this is good. I think we're, I, I like that it's not dragging. Um, is, is Hayek's thesis, uh, compelling basically? And you know, what other theories can explain the same data? So, so basically like, I, I think maybe we agree on this. Maybe we have different angles, but I think, I think we can sort of both agree to some extent that like there's a crisis of democracy going on in America. Um, which, which to me is like very, uh, troubling and like, you know, I, I think about a lot. I worry about a lot. And it seems to me that as far as I could tell, I found nothing in this book that could like speak to that crisis of liberalism in America. And I was wondering if you really? agree with it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the issue of agreement does because when the state takes on too much, then there is less and less agreement about what exactly it is doing. And so when you have the state 
providing health care and this sort of thing. When you go and vote, someone who's voting for another politician isn't just someone who has a political difference with you that you can set aside, right, when you're at a family gathering. There's someone who's literally threatening your health care, right? And so I think that that issue of agreement speaks very specifically to our time. Let me think about that. I want to, I want to, uh, yeah, give me, give me a second to think about that. It sounds like you're describing political polarization. Is that, is that a reasonable characterization of what you're describing? So it's like, it's like, would it be fair to characterize like Hayek's, a part of Hayek's point here that democracy leads to political polarization, which then. Yes, but that's also what he's talking about uh, when he's referring to uh, the, the anti-liberal sentiments in Germany, right? That is expressed by the fascists and the socialists, and that's about as polarized as you can get. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing today, where you have the left and the right, who have both, both of whom have been driving to the margins for some time, and then you have liberals who are stuck in the middle, people like me who are sympathetic to Hayek, saying, I don't like either of these alternatives, in the same way that people in Germany were saying, the liberals were saying, I don't like either of these alternatives of the socialists or the fascists. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, those two, even though they're polarized, they have more in common with each other than they do that person we're talking about, that classical liberal, which is why I also get so frustrated when you read Eric Hobsbawm, who is a socialist historian, and he went to Germany and he said, well, when I looked at the fascists, how could I not be a socialist? Well, our response is when you look at the fascists and the socialists, how can you not be a liberal, a classical liberal, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, I think this speaks very clear to our time. Well, interesting. So there's a lot for me to digest here. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to like shoot from the hip and, and like not fully digest what you're saying um, and, and respond to it. Um, but I mean, I want to make sure I fully understand what you're saying before I, before I try to respond. So I guess, I guess here's where we agree, right? You and I, I think, agree that we are like both, that democracy is extremely important, right? And, and, and the, a crisis of democracy means that we're in danger of losing something, which is very important. It seems to me in America that to be on the side of democracy means that you're sensitive to what a majority of Americans want and can benefit from. Whereas to be on the side, to be anti-liberal is to, is to not care um, what a a de like a reasonably democratic uh, population um, would want. Now that's very vague. The left likes to do this thing, which is dangerous, and I don't want to play it because it's risky, but they like to say, like, according to polls, you know, 70% of people think that healthcare is a right or something like that. Now, the reason it's tricky is because it depends on how you, like, formulate the polls, and, and obviously, I think, reasonably, you know, a majority of people might not want disruption in, like, America's healthcare system, so it's, it's a tricky game to play, but, but I do feel like, I do feel like it's not, it's not a given that the side of democracy is less government. The side of democracy very, very well could be, you know, majority of Americans hypothetically want more government, and that's and that that's that's preservation of democracy. That that's that's like democracy winning. No, those are institutional ends that are at odds with a democratic framework. So the way I would pose it is this: is what if a majority of people want a totalitarian system or want programs that would lead to that system? Right? They're they're supporting policies that are in conflict with the means by which they're achieving them, right? That's what we mean by saying that central planning isn't uh, compatible with. But there's nothing totalitarian. It can be temporarily, it can be temporarily, but eventually if you push this incoherence too, too far, you, you, you have the problem that Hayek is talking about. Again, you, you, can, you can have some of this going on that you're talking about within a democratic system. You can have delegation, you can have the welfare state, you can have some policies like that, but there is a point at which that gets pushed too far and you have, a, 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 I, I'm trying not to be hyperbolic here, but I, I guess you would have a totalized state and eventually it wouldn't look anything like that democratic system that you, that you started with. Okay, so there, there's still there's still a piece there which I don't fully uh, understand, but that's okay. I want to ask you a slightly different question though. Um, so 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 again, there's a lot we agree on. There's a lot we really agree on. We, we we agree on this crisis issue and this question of like to what extent does Hayek speak to this crisis that we agree I think is a real crisis. So so my questions are like, what other factors could be explaining this crisis? Like, do you think, in your opinion, 
or I mean Hayek's opinion, we can talk about Hayek, let's say, runaway income inequality. If you have a system where the one percent is is exploding in wealth and there's stagnant wages for the bottom, you know, seventy percent, whatever, can that be a threat to liberalism? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think when we're talking about income inequality, income inequality uh, is a political problem. I completely agree, and specifically in the sense that you mean it. But when we're talking in terms of economics, I think that inequality is a proxy for other economic problems that are going on. Uh, so industry concentration, inflating profits, right? Things like that. So inequality is not necessarily, I think, an economic problem, but it is certainly a political problem. There are economic problems lying behind that differential that, that, are, the, that are the core of the issue. In, in America today, or I think it's a, it should apply in general, do you, do you think that economic power, like the collection of wealth, um, translates into political power? It can, sure. So like these are examples of, of other reasons why I can imagine people turning on the democratic or liberal political system that, that I perceive as being in crisis. And I see these as being potentially more salient uh, concerns. But again, this is a point that Hayek makes. When you talk about the state delegating more things and you're saying that's perfectly in line with the democracy, well, the bigger the state is, the more state there is for large private corporations to purchase, so to speak, right? It mm -hmm. then becomes the avenue by which you get things done. You can do things by the economic means, which is through transactions, trying to earn a profit, right? Sometimes making a loss, or you can do things by the political means, right? And the larger the state, the more things are going to be done that way. Interesting. So yeah, I, I know that there's, there's like often um, like a big emphasis on like rent seeking behavior and things like that in which corporations can take advantage of like, let's say, you know, government programs or government research. Um, and then, and then, but then we also have to think about what are the consequences if this, these delegated institutions make it make a mistake. What's their incentive incentive? Pardon me to stop making this mistake. Well, there isn't one because their incentives are all political. But if a corporation makes an error, what's in, its incentive to stop? Well, it's that they're running at a loss, right? So does does your does your data back that up? Is does the FAA that protects air travel do they not have an incentive, practically speaking? to protect people's lives in airplanes? Like, to do you stop, think- Yeah, to stop planes from falling out of the right. sky. yeah. But th the thing is that these uh, programs started in the 19th century with the railway, and they were actually means by which to grant them monopoly priv privilege. And then afterwards, it was done with trucking, right? And then later on, it was also done in other industries as well. And so the question, again, is are these institutions conferring privileges on some of these companies, and I think they absolutely are. I Even the FAA? The FAA? Be done, whether or not it could be done by someone else. That being said, I don't really, I mean, that, that's not really a hill I'm willing to die on, the FAA. Well, to me, it's very important. Like, to me, it's an example of the fact that we, government is invisible in our lives. You know, when I buy a car seat for my child, like, the, I trust it's not going to, like, it's not that invisible safe. in the price. It's not invisible in the price. Through all the regulations, I, I haven't read any new research on here, but there was tons of research done on this in the 80s when it was a problem. And at that time, the average price of a car was inflated by something like $800 because of the set of regulations. And that's only gotten worse since then. And so for those of us who can afford a car, sure, it may feel invisible, but for those of you who can't, it certainly isn't. And what they end up doing is driving older, less safe vehicles on the road. So invisible sure but there are plenty there are plenty of consequences so i'd be interested to see that research i mean it's a problem of the seen and the unseen and part of becoming a good economist as hayek said in another place is being able to understand what those unseen consequences are and that's seen all around us for example the price of a car sure no i mean i certainly agree with that uh characterization of like the seen and the unseen i think that's that's totally true i mean um Okay, that, this, this is good food for thought. I, I, if you want to send me that, uh, that, that paper, I'd, I'd be curious to see it. But again, in my mind, the, the offset of the cost is, is, is something which is offset with, with the, the safety benefit because we do rely on uh, regulations for, for like safe food, you know, for safe air travel. And yeah, and again, I don't find that specific example as objectionable as I do other ones, but you can see back to that point I made about categorical decisions. You made a categorical decision about safety and you've generalized the, the cost 
mm-hmm. right, among people who are buying cars. So it's a third party, the state imposing this cost on people who are purchasing cars. You've made that categorical decision for them, where, whereas it would have been done individually. In the case of car cars, I don't find it nearly as objectionable as I do in other areas of the economy, but Okay. But again, the point is still there. I, to me, I see that as being under democratic control, even though the chain is sort of hard to trace. Like ultimately, we elect people who are do have incentives. Because you guys, were, the original question that they we, could have, but couldn't have they chosen a different set of regulations? Well, so what, really it's anything a, that they had chosen based on the delegated process, you'd be calling democratic. Well, if if, so then, if the well, outcomes well, then, were what, bad, then what isn't democratic? No, if the outcomes were bad, the, the, well, look, when I hire, it be democratic. look, look, David, if, if I hire an employee in my company, okay, to do a job, let's say I, I work in a tech company and let's say I don't write code, but I'm hiring someone who does. I mean, we look at track record and we look at performance on the job and we look at, you know, and, and we hire someone who's, who's competent. And so I think the political process works that way. Now you ask what happens if, if the outcomes are bad, if the outcomes are bad, then democratic officials would lose their job. And there's like a chain, like the, the people who do the appointments. Um, no, that's, would, that's not what I said. I, I'm saying that you think the, it's democratic so long as the outcomes are good. Mm-hmm. But according to you, that's the highest point is that there isn't always going to be agreement on that. You've just chosen stylized examples where you think it's obvious, but it's not I, always well, obvious. And the more that the state takes on, the, the less obvious that it becomes and the more disagreement there is. Mm-hmm. And so what I was asking you, is they could have that delegated body could have made any number of decisions about regulations is there a decision they could have made that you would have called undemocratic and is it based on the fact that it was arbitrary or because you didn't like the outcomes it sounds to me that it's because you don't like the outcomes well i think undemocratic would mean a majority of the people don't like the outcomes or it might be a democratic process but it might be an outcome which you know needs to be held democratically accountable because the outcome is negative like you're going to evaluate policy based on polls then well, that's what democracy is all about. I mean, politicians are constantly checking polls on everything because they want to be in the, you know, favorable in the eyes of their uh, constituents. Like, like when I look at when I look at foreign uh, other other countries that have a stronger social safety net, um, it, it, I, I would expect based on reading a book like Hayek's and, and based on our conversation that like big government programs like uh, universal health care, uh, like in Canada, which is like a very, very extreme version of that um, would lead to like, I don't know, increased political polarization or something, or like people feeling like the well, government- Well, they do. Is they- do you, have you ever read the newspaper from these countries? Do you think there's no debate over the NHS? Well, right? there these certainly is debate, are, but, but I've seen polls- It's the center of all their elections. Well, I've seen polls that show that the NHS has a very high- Oh, rate. yes, they very much like it. That's true. And that tends to happen even in the United States, where when they introduce a new uh, social welfare policy, it gets a lot of resistance. Then once it's in place, people tend to like it in terms mm-hmm. of polls. So I, don't, I don't care what people like. The question is, what is the economics? That's what I'm interested in, or political consequences. Well, I do care what people like. I think that's a big difference between us. Then. Okay. Well, what people like being decided for them, right? I suppose is what I mean. The problem is. Well, no, I want politicians who are very sensitive to what people like and don't like, and are. Well, then these wouldn't get passed in the first place. Social Security had plenty of resistance to it. I'm just saying, if you want to evaluate policies based on polls, sure, but I don't think it's very principled. And I also think you're opening yourself up to the fickle attitudes of the populace, which- Potentially, but I think, I think when people elect an official, they're not electing a policy necessarily. They're electing a fighter. It's like when you pick a lawyer for a court case, right? You're not necessarily picking the entire case. You're saying, this is someone who's gonna fight with my best interest in mind and is gonna consult with experts and hire a team of policy experts because I trust this person is going to do what's best for me, right? I mean, and it doesn't always work out, obviously. Yeah, I don't know how much talking to experts there is going on versus uh, people who are rent seeking. Policy teams, like every politician has huge policy teams. Like it's on the news now. Joe Biden's policy team is like uh, written about every day. Add someone new. I mean, you know, think tanks, like the the, the conservative think tank world is very, uh, is is filled with, you know, all sorts of uh, policy teams. I think you have a more romantic view of government. Maybe, I maybe. I don't know. I, I don't think it's very romantic. I think, but, but anyway, this has been interesting. What, what, what do you mean? Politicians only looking out for the voters, consulting experts in the decisions. It doesn't, it doesn't always make. work. It's not, it's not romantic because I, I think it doesn't always work. It's not romantic because I think that there's a lot of places where things can go wrong and they do go wrong. Um, but ultimately, like a, a classic example is like flip-flopping, you know? 
um, when 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 uh, a lot of people get upset when when politicians change. You know, for B Joe Biden tacked hard to the left in this election. There's like a million examples of that. To me, that's like democracy working because Joe Biden wants to win an election, and Joe Biden wants to be happy. You know, have positive approval rating with his constituents, and so he's going to tack with the political wins. And that's 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 a, that's a positive win for democracy in my mind. For example, you know. Anyway. Anyway. This has been very interesting. Do you want to, um, this has been going on for a long time. You want to wrap it up? Final words, final questions, final thoughts, anything? Um, I, I don't know. What, I guess what, what, was I able to clarify anything for you? Yes, in terms of yes, that? a lot, a lot. David, this has been hugely appreciated for me, hugely. I, I, can't, I can't tell you. Um, I had so many I, questions. I think it's really important to understand the, I, I was just saying, I think it's really important to understand the political and economic conversation that was going on at the time because it was so much reaction to that and that can make it strange uh, reading for someone right now. And it's also important to keep in mind what his central argument was. It wasn't any kind of slippery slope argument. He was saying, as I said before, comprehensive central planning is not compatible with democracy. Awesome. This has been, this has been great, David. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>